Good morning, everyone. And Romana, thank you for a typically very generous and undeservedly generous introduction. I gave this talk the ambitious title referring to David Jones and others for the very simple reason that I wasn't at the time quite sure which others they would be. You know, it's like giving titles for conference papers. But you'll find out shortly that the focus of my discussion will be one particular contemporary English writer. And I'll leave you guessing for just a little longer. So let's begin with The Sleeping Lord, one of David Jones's fragments, first published, if I remember rightly, in the special issue of Agenda, um, published in 1967. I have my battered original copy here. And this fragment, The Sleeping Lord, begins from the image of a prehistoric burial of a young man in South Wales. It opens out onto a vision of ancient Celtic kingship in its context. It moves towards the Arthurian environment and imagines a scene <clears throat> in Arthur's Hall the bishop blessing the meat recalls all the departed that he is meant to hold in mind. And as usual with David Jones, you're dealing with an archaeology of reference that is formidably complex. Within running through all of this, and you'll see later on how important a theme this is, running through all of this is the persistent legend in Wales and elsewhere of literally the sleeping lord, that is the King Arthur who is asleep in a cave somewhere, waiting for Britain's greatest need when he will emerge with his knights to restore justice, honor, and civilized value in this country. Frankly, this sounds like the perfect time, but um, <laughs> if you hear hoofbeats in Trafalgar Square during this address, don't be surprised. But one of the most distinctive aspects of this remarkable fragment is the way in which we move gradually towards an assimilation of the sleeping Lord to the land under which he sleeps. Here's the conclusion of the fragment. Yet he sleeps on, very deep is his slumber. How long has he been the sleeping Lord? Are the clammy ferns his rustling valance? Does the buried rowan ward him from evil or does he ward the tangle wood and the denizens of the wood? Are the stunted oaks his gnarled guard, or are their gnarled limbs strong with his sap? Do the small black horses grass on the hunch of his shoulders? Are the hills his couch, or is he the couchant hills? Are the slumbering valleys him in slumber? Are the still undulations the still limbs of him sleeping? In the, is the configuration of the land the furrowed body of the Lord? Are the scarred ridges his dented greaves? Do the trickling gullies yet drain his hog wounds? Does the land wait the sleeping Lord? Or is the wasted land that very Lord who sleeps? In a review of this, published in another issue of Agenda, um, this time from 1974. Sorry, let me just check my reference here. Jeremy Hooker. No, I have the wrong item. I think, I think it's Poetry Wales. That's right, it's the 1972 winter issue of Poetry Wales. Um, Jeremy Hooker, the Anglo-Welsh poet, writes this. The sleeping Lord effects the identification with Wales of Arthur, but of an Arthur who is both the young nobilis, the first of the sleepers of Cretani, and a type of Christ. His sleep is the sleep of the regenerative powers that are Wales for David Jones. And that's a phrase which I think will help will bear keeping in mind as we reflect on these themes. The sleep is the sleep of regenerative powers. So the Arthur, the lost king, who is once and yet to come, represents not only 
the potentiality, half lost but never completely absent, of human history, but also the regenerative power that lies in the land itself. You don't need me to remind you that David Jones is supremely a poet of place, of locality. But we find that this is not simply a kind of sentimental attachment to a particular kind of human landscape. One of the things which increasingly interests him as his poetry unfolds, especially um, before, during, and after the publication of the Anathemata in the 50s, one of the themes that increasingly preoccupies him is the notion of a meaning that is, if you like, a regenerative power within the entire evolutionary process. And readers of his Anathemata will know that this is precisely his starting point in that remarkable work. So if we're talking about regenerative power, we're talking about something more than human history. Here he is in the first section of the Anathemata, writing about geology. From before all time, the new light beams for them and with eternal clarities infuls it and athwart the four times, era, period, epoch, chimera, through all orogeny, group, system, series, zone, writing at the five life layers, species, species, genera, families, order, piercing the eschard silt, discovering every stria, each score and macula, lighting all the fragile laminae of the shales. However, Calypso has shuffled the marked pack, veiling with early the late, through all unconformities and the sills without sequence, glorying all the under dapple, lighting the Cretaceous and the Trias. For Tyrannosaurus must somehow lie down with herbivores, or the poet lied, which is not allowed. However violent the contortion or whatever the inversion of the folding, oblique through the fire wrought cold rock diked from convulsions under, through the slow sedimentations laid by his patient creature of water, whichever the direction of the strike, whether the hade is to the upthrow or the fault normal, through all metamorphs or whatever the pseudomorphoses. You need to know a little bit about geology, which I don't, to follow that passage in its entirety. But the point, I think, is clear enough. Here, indeed, are the regenerative powers in the prehistoric upheavals of the rocks. The patient creature of water works upon the rock, and indeed, as we see elsewhere in this section, the creatures of air and fire likewise shape this unimaginably extended process of development and change towards the point at which we now stand. So this first section, right and four time of the anathemata ends with that well-known and resonant climax where the entire evolutionary process is, as it were, the kind of accelerando effect pushed towards the moment of the mass. How else, from the weathered mantle rock and the dark humus spread, where is exacted the night labor, where the essential and laboring worm saps micro workings all the day long for his creature of air, should his barleys grow, who said, I am your bread. So prehistoric geology has something to do with the mass. That's one way of summarizing the anathemata. There's probably scope for some kind of um, weekly journal competition summarizing the anathemata in one sentence, but I, I leave that to you for leisure time. But what this is saying is, of course, that meaning is always already coded in the universe we inhabit. The poet's task is not to impose meaning on a blank sheet. The poet's task is to release, in some sense, those regenerative powers which are woven in to the entire history of the material world we inhabit, including, of course, the human history, whose strata we repeatedly excavate 
in our daily language in ways we barely understand. Of course, one of the most interesting passages in one of those wonderful essays in Epoch and Artist is where Jones begins from a man sending flowers to his girlfriend and opens that out, rather like opening an artichoke, leaf after leaf after leaf opens out to show just how many layers of reference there are, symbolic or mythical reference in a man giving flowers to his girlfriend. And what if she's called Flora on top of all that, says Jones, with a final kind of flourish. Poetry then is a kind of archeology, span a living archeology. span Stuart Piggott, a very noted British archeologist, span wrote a wonderful little essay printed in both issues of Agenda about David Jones, in which he writes, the past of man is something continuous and one can never be certain that it is really past and not present, or even more disconcertingly, future. And he goes on to say, perhaps it is not for nothing that deposits is a favorite word of David Jones, both in poetry and in prose. Deposits are an essential part of his poetry. And he notes Riley there, as does another archeologist writing about him in another collection, that it may seem extremely unlikely that anybody <clears throat> should be able to squeeze profound and moving poetry out of geology, but Jones does it without simply being pedantic or abstract. The Lord and the land are assimilated. The human past and the geological past somehow belong together. And our identity, therefore, our identity is created and shaped by its maker and redeemer through locality, which is cultural identity and material identity. Identity not in the sense of a possession to be defended in the form of contemporary identity politics of one sort or another, but identity in the sense of knowing what the resources are on which your individual and collective selfhood can be grown and nourished. As we'll see later on, rootlessness is one of the problems identified by Jones and others in connection with this. But we carry the genetic imprint, not only of our human ancestry, but of an entire material history, geological history of pre-human, pre historic history, which moves us towards the humanity we can and must for our life and salvation occupy. And that human history, which is irreducibly also a history of violence, rupture and division, that human history has within it, for Jones as a Catholic Christian, a moment where, I think this is the only way I can really put it, there is a sort of feedback into the entire process as a consequence of one historical event, that is the Paschal event. That one historical event reinterprets, remakes the entirety of earthly history. Christ, you might say, saves not only humanity, but the geological strata as well. That is, if humanity is to be saved, everything that makes humanity human is saved or redeemed. That's what I mean by feedback. Something emerges within history whose impact back upon its history is incalculable, which is why Stuart Piggott rightly says it's not only about the past and the present, it's also more um, startlingly about possible futures. So our sacramental practice in the Eucharist is a way of making all this articulate, a very, very particular kind of poetics is at work here, in which the, the redemptive feedback within history that is the Paschal event becomes a space into which we enter so that our own past and present and future is reconstituted by it and liberated by it. The Paschal event 
is the moment where the lines of both tension and connection throughout earthly history converge. And in that event, past, present, and future are all densely layered, which is why the anathemata moves towards the representation of the celebration of the mass in a particular context, why the events of Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday are the inescapable subtext of the anathemata and indeed of the sleeping Lord. And also, of course, of in parenthesis, but that's, that's just a parenthetical comment on um, more work to be done. And the Christ who says, I am your bread, is the Christ who owns in that moment the entire material past. So that's part of what I mean by the archaeology of David Jones's aesthetic. No surprises here, you're all, I trust, familiar with most of Jones's work. And you'll know exactly what I mean by that sense of what John Heath Stubbs in a slightly critical review of The Sleeping Lord called The Straiter that you're always working with in Jones's work. And Heath Stubbs picks up, as do one or two other commentators, the um, symbolic importance in the anathemata of the excavation of the site of Troy, where you have this wonderful image of the, the nine layers of different cities through which you have to dig down in order to find what it was that Homer was writing about. Jones then is always, I won't say problematizing the present, that's put it rather negatively, but relocating the present moment against, first of all, the entire archeological background of earth, earthly and earthy history, and against the background of that moment within earthy, earthy and earthly history, when transformation or change becomes possible. Poetics is about activating the sleeping regenerative power in our history, our geology and our archeology, span but activating that regenerative power in a very particular way in reference to, we might say not the sleeping, but the waking Lord who keeps watch on the night of Maundy Thursday. We are made and we are makers because of this central moment of what I called feedback. It's not a determinist view of history, as if we are simply what has happened to us, the sum of what has happened to us. The mass, like the event of Calvary and resurrection, looks both backwards and forwards. And our whole human activity, distinctively human activity of meaning making, is gathered under this rubric, enabled by the Christ of the Eucharist, the one who says, I am your bread. All acts of effective human interpretation pass through this event, the waste of the hourglass, as you might say, in history, where the past is transfigured and the future is enabled. So that's part of what I meant by speaking in my title of the fixed place we occupy. We are located within this geological, archeological, historical past. We are located within the event which makes sense of it. And the particularities of our belonging, our language systems, our interpretative enterprises, the particularity of those is always something which opens out onto that immense vista. It matters to be rooted it matters not just to be rooted. It matters that we know where we come from. It matters that we know that we are growing. It matters that we know what has constrained us. It matters that we know what has released us. To 
to turn then from David Jones to a very different writer. I'll begin with where the connection comes to mind. Some of you will perhaps know the story. Once upon a time, there was a farmer in Macclesfield in Lancashire. And he was taking a white horse to market. On the way, he met a strange old man whom he'd never seen before near Alderley Edge in Cheshire. Let me buy that white horse, said the old man. No, said the farmer, I'm taking it to market. I want to get a proper price for it. I'll give you whatever you ask, said the old man. No, thank you, said the farmer, a proper hard-headed Lancashire man. I'll trust the market. Clearly a man very much at home in the 20th and 21st century. Off went the farmer to market and attempted all day long to sell the white horse. But he failed again and again. As evening drew on, he was leading the white horse back towards Macclesfield. And there by the side of the road was the same old man. I knew, said the old man, you would fail to sell your horse. But I will give you a good price for it, follow me. The old man led the farmer on towards Alderley Edge in Cheshire. A great ridge, wooded ridge, with some very mysterious prehistoric remains on it. The old man struck his staff against the side of the edge, and the cliff side opened, and in went the old man and the farmer followed with the white horse. And there, in a great cave under Alderley Edge, some hundred armed knights lay asleep. And in the midst of them all, a single figure wearing a crown. All around, gold, jewels, armor, weapons. Here, said the old man, the king sleeps until he is called for. But each of these knights will need a white horse on which to ride. And one of the white horses has disappeared, has wandered away. So I will give you whatever you ask for your white horse. The money was paid over, the white horse was delivered. The farmer went back to Macclesfield and told the story to his children and grandchildren. There are many versions of this story both in Britain and in Europe, actually. In Europe, it's sometimes Frederick Barbarossa and sometimes Charlemagne who sleeps under the hill. In Britain, it's usually King Arthur. The Sleeping Lord. Alan Garner, one of the most remarkable writers of the last half century, to my mind, was born very near Alderley Edge in Cheshire and grew up with that story as part of his mental world. The first book he wrote in the early 60s was a children's book, which turns on the story of the Sleeping Lord, the Sleeping King, under Alderley Edge. It was, in the early 60s, a work which was all too easily bracketed with Tolkien and C.S. Lewis as alternative world fantasy. But I think a sensitive reader would notice a far deeper, I'd say, metaphysical agenda going on in Garner's work. He went on to write a couple more children's books, and then a couple of books best described, I suppose, as young adult literature. And then at very long intervals, a couple of extraordinarily disturbing, profound, poetic fantasies, novels, I don't know what to call them, for adults. You'll see the connection with David Jones's Sleeping Lord is an irresistible one. But it's not just that. I want to spend just a little bit of time introducing you to one or two of Alan Garner's later fictions to show how Garner, if I read him correctly, is doing something of what Jones is doing from a radically different perspective. Garner's deep sense of place of the intelligence and action of place is one of the things which he has written about most often. 
as I say, he grew up in the part of Cheshire where he still lives. He's written about the history of his own family and made small fictions out of aspects of his family's history. And he is deeply convinced that there is something about the landscape which codes itself in us, transmits itself to us, and that our alienation from place in general, and in particular, places where our own humanity has, has developed, our alienation is one of the problems of our contemporary culture. But he also recognizes, as I think David Jones does, that this embodiment of meaning in place and this inheritance from the long history and prehistory of a place is double-edged. Places can also encode disastrous, damaging, traumatic memory. And three of his most powerful and disturbing books turn on exactly this question of traumatic memory. In 1967, he published a book called The Owl Service. The Owl Service. Um, the title comes from the fact that a, a leading role in the book is played by an antique dinner service patterned with owls and flowers. Now, behind this book is yet another bit of folklore, which has to do with one of the stories from the medieval Welsh Mabinogion. From the fourth branch of the Mabinogi, the story of Mathva Mafonwy. Much as I would love to tell you that story at length, I'll resist the temptation for the moment. But the point is that the owl service is predicated on the idea that the valley in which those distant mythical events took place is the valley in which a couple of families are currently living. One is an incoming English family with a holiday home there. Um, they are averagely dim-witted middle-class English people who have, sorry, I'm Welsh, <laughs> who, who have very little sense of what actually it's like to live in Wales. <clears throat> um, the other family, if you can call it that, are the, the single mother, Nancy, who keeps house for them in this holiday home, and her moody teenage son, Gwyn. And as the novel unfolds, you see with a rather chilling shock that the patterns of relationship between the three young people, Gwyn, the Welsh boy, and Roger, the English boy, and his stepsister, Alison, these patterns are re-embodying the dramatic, indeed rather horrific, pattern of relationship in the Welsh story. Everything is heading towards crisis and destruction. It's a beautiful book. Um, I had the great good fortune of reading it when I was 17, when it first appeared. And that's absolutely the right time to read it for the first time. But it's advisable to go on reading it once every five years or so, I think, because there's always more to it. And very typically of Garner's style, a lot of it is dialogue, a lot of it is very oblique and difficult. <laughs> Some of it is in Welsh. Uh, but <clears throat> essentially, it's about the encoding of a particular kind of memory in a place which threatens to be utterly destructive. As it happens at the very end, there is a grinding change of gear, which quite unexpectedly allows disaster to be averted. And that grinding change of gear has something to do with the fact that one of the main characters unexpectedly finds himself able to receive and absorb the violent feelings of another rather than retaliating. And something shifts in the landscape, literally and metaphorically. It's not exactly what I'd call a redemptive story because it, it finishes just with that moment. And what's going to happen to it, we don't know. But there is a kind of redemptive ending. A few years after that, Garner published another 
technically young adult fiction called Red Shift. Again, very typically of his work, the title is itself a kind of layered archaeological construct. Red Shift refers, as some of you may know, to a particular phenomenon in astronomy, observation of certain um, shifts in the perceptibility of stars over imagined temporal distances, you know, what you see of a star that that was not there at the time, is no longer there or whatever. But also red shift is exactly what it says. Um, it's a red dress, it's a piece of red cloth. And that too features in the story. The layering of this is another, um, set in another numinous feature of the landscape of Northwestern England, this time Mo Cop between Chester and Crewe, an enormous outcrop of rock in a very flat landscape with what appears to be a ruined castle on the top of it. It is in fact a 19th century folly, but that's by the way. We meet this landscape first in the context of Roman Britain. A group of Roman legionaries have deserted their legion um, because the legion is being marched up to, to the north of England to do more construction work on the Roman wall and fight off the Picts, and they decide that enough is enough, really. So they, they go native. Their speech is deliberately modeled on that of American GIs in Vietnam, which gives a very edgy feel to those scenes. And like American GIs going fear in Vietnam, these are desperate, traumatized young men who pass on their trauma to those around. They, they kill the local inhabitants, they enslave and rape, and they set up a little kind of stockade on Mo Cop with one of the enslaved British people that they've, they've been living alongside and, and killing. Um, it's, a, it's a very painful and uh, quite gory set of episodes. Second layer is from the 17th century, from the English Civil War. The little church of Bartholomew near Mocop was the scene of a massacre in the English Civil War when a number of local villagers were killed in cold blood by um, soldiers of the Royalist Party. And woven in with this episode is a complex set of relationships among some of the villagers. I'll come back to that in just a moment. And the third layer is the contemporary scene where two teenagers are negotiating a painfully dissolving relationship in which they realize that they don't and can't trust each other as they thought they could. It's an almost unreadably painful book. It's nearly all in dialogue. And you have to attend very closely because the dialogue may suddenly shift from uh, approximately 90 AD to 1630 something to 1970 something without warning. You have to work very hard to follow how the relationships overlap, interpret one another, make sense of one another. There's one consistent image, which is a stone ax head buried in the first episode, dug up in the 17th century and rediscovered in the 20th. There are no happy endings in this book. But within the second episode, the 17th century episode, an unexpected moment comes when the rejected lover of one of the village women, quite unexpectedly, quite unpredictably, saves the life of his former lover and her present lover. The only point of light in the book. And you're left asking, is that something which speaks of regenerative power, which might work backwards as well as forwards in some sense to make the overall picture of the um, coded trauma in this place bearable. The 
The book ends, though, with a phrase which Garner says was the inspiration for him of the entire book. It was a bit of graffiti that he'd seen, I think, in a station waiting room or a bus shelter in Crewe or somewhere near, near there, which simply said, not really now, not anymore. And that's, that's the end. You make what you can of it. Not really now, not anymore. In the context, it appears to be something about the, the death, the brutal death of love and trust. But is there also a not anymore? Because there's been somewhere in all this, a moment of redemptive acceptance or transformation. Well, Garner's not a preacher. He leaves us. He's a novelist. He leaves us with that. The third of his fictions that I want to mention, and I, I hope I'm whetting your appetite for Alan Garner, the third fiction I want to mention is one of his adult books from um, the early 21st century. And this is called Thursbitch. Thursbitch is the name of a large valley, again in the Cheshire Derbyshire borderland, um, associated with all kinds of very unsettling folklore memories. It's, for some of its history, been locally known as the Valley of the Demon. And it contains several prehistoric um, uh, border posts marking out the borders between territories, one or two structures which may be medieval or maybe much older. Who knows? It's quite possible that it was um, what archaeologists would call a ritual landscape in prehistoric tribal society. And once again, Garner does one of his time shifts. The characters we first meet are two 21st century figures who seem to be 40-ish. One of them is a woman who is suffering from an irreversible degenerative disease. I think we're meant to understand it to be motor neuron disease. And the other figure is her carer, who is a man of about her own age, and it transpires someone who knew her in an earlier life, um, who happens also to be a priest, who is, who is exploring alternatives to his conventional priesthood. And they have a sort of uneasy, jokey, sparring relationship, uh, which has never quite got to be romantic, but has great intimacy. And the other setting is the 18th century. And Garner imagines this very, very remote community in the 18th century to be one that has preserved almost intact a prehistoric pagan cult, a shamanistic cult of the, the sacred bull who is worshipped. And the chapter on the annual ceremony of going into the bull is, for my money, the most powerful and effective description of shamanistic experience in the English language that I know about. And the um, shaman of this cult is a man called Jack, a local peddler, a traveling tradesman, who in fact travels over the whole world, comes back with very exotic things from the rest of the world. But this is, this is where he comes back to. This is where he is the priest and the, the poet of his society. We know that a traveling peddler was caught in a storm nearby in the 18th century and was frozen to death on the hills above Thursbitch. And the record of this in a local um, chronicle and indeed a local um, plaque marking the place says that to everyone's surprise, um, when his body was found, a single footprint was found in the snow alongside it, looking like a woman's foot. Well, you can imagine how Garner works on all of this. Effectively, what happens is that the, the sick woman of the 21st century decides eventually to commit suicide rather than die of motor neuron disease. And that involves her in stepping off a cliff near Thursbridge. So, of course, the footprint is hers. Her 21st century footprint marks the 18th century tragedy. 
But again, we're left to understand that in some very elusive sense, the lonely death in the 18th century and the lonely death of the 21st century console one another. <coughs> there is a kind of coming together of fusion. And with an amazing uh, and very typical bravado, Alan Garner ends this fusion of episodes by quoting the Romanian folk song, Mioritza, which is about a shepherd boy dying in the hills. And as he dies, expressing his faith and trust that the, the regenerative power of all that he is part of and is part of him will come to his aid and receive him into a transformed world. So the Mioritza, which as I say is quite, quite a well-known folk poem in Romania, interprets, frames this very dramatic story. There are very few books of which one can truthfully say they're unput downable. Thursbitch for me was one of them and made such an impact that I found it was several years before I could bring myself to open it again. So disturbing and so potent is it. Anyway, I could talk a lot about Alan Garner, whom, as you will gather, I love deeply. But I think you may begin to see the connection I'm trying to make here. Garner, like Jones, is a poet and artist of archaeology, interpretative archaeology. He's somebody who sees physical landscape, physical location as itself, you could say, intelligent, communicating intelligence into our own intelligence. We are who we are and what we are because of all this. And that can be deeply healing and it can be deeply destructive. And Garner himself has written as movingly as you would expect about his own experience of bipolar disorder and his own attempts to cope with traumatic memory. A book of his essays called The Voice That Thunders, very aptly, and this contains not only some of his essays about the local landscape in Cheshire, in which he was born and grew up, but also a much more demanding lecture called Inner Time, in which he speaks about the moment at which his awareness of his own traumatized history first came to light. He begins that essay on inner time. This essay describes a Western European's experience of a primitive catastrophic process, its cause and its resolution. He worked with a psychiatrist, a rather controversial psychiatrist, in fact, um, who had developed the idea of what he called an engram, not enneagram, I hasten to add, but engram. That is, our experience affects us, imprints us in the form of this engram. We have a pattern of response that is somehow coded within us by deeply disturbing experience. And to understand how that works and to move away from its control, simply recycling it, we have to recover memory at a very deep level. The psychiatrist said to Garner, you must go where it hurts most. You must go where it hurts most in your memory. And that is when the release begins. And that understanding of the engram is for Garner something of what he's doing in his fiction and other bits of his writing showing how what is encoded in us is not fate or destiny, but it is something which requires healing regenerative imagination. And the artist recovering 
that engrammatized pattern of activity is playing their part in the release that is required. Psychiatrists who would take the matter further and say that we inherit genetically and engrammatically maintain that we have built into us the experience of our parents from their conception to our own, that our parents have inherited likewise from our grandparents. It is obvious that within a few generations of compounded inner times, the number of engrams available will approach infinity. And whether we call the result inherited inner time, the collective unconscious, or patterns of general human behavior, the day-to-day -day result is the same. But what makes me look at the connection there with Jones is partly that idea of going where it hurts most. Because it struck me that one way of understanding what David Jones is saying about the Eucharist, and indeed what Christian theology says about the anamnesis of Christ's suffering, is that this is an act of going where it hurts most in terms of the entire history of the world. Where does it hurt most? Where is the deepest alienation between humanity and reality? On the cross. So that's where we go. The engram is our own repeated refusal of reality, our own refusal to understand our own rootedness, our own, our own createdness. But to go to that point of hurt, rupture, woundedness, is part of how we activate the buried or sleeping restorative power, regenerative power. And that's part of what the mass is about. I've never quite known what Alan Garner wants to say about his own religious convictions. Um, I'm happy and privileged to count him as a friend. And we talk around this from time to time. He wouldn't, I think, want to call himself a Christian, and yet the imagination that comes through is one that, to my mind, fits remarkably well with the particular ways in which regenerative imagination works for somebody like David Jones. So I don't want to turn Alan into a theologian, Melchior Louis, and yet reading his work has been one of the ways in which, for me at least, Jones's archaeology of interpretation has come alive more freshly, and I turn from one to the other with increasing interest and illumination. But just before I finish, I want to come back to one of the themes of this conference at large, the poetics of liturgy and place. The relation of all this to what we might say about liturgy is something I've already hinted at in using the image, which is suggested to me by the anathemata, of passing through this place of rupture or hurt, which is for all of us summed up in the, the Paschal events. We return to the source of the worst injury in order to be, to be recovered. I think also of Geoffrey Hill's um, famous lecture on um, extremity and opportunity. I think it was his inaugural lecture at the University of Leeds as professor of English poetry. Liturgy then is the making of a landscape in which meaning is released. Liturgy is the pattern of words and actions that will take us where it hurts most will take us to the moment of rupture and enact release and promise. And that means that above all, liturgy needs space, physical, imaginative, oral space. It needs to have room for what is buried, the regenerative powers to come alive. It needs room to cope with the ramifying implications of our own story 
and the story of our world. It needs to evoke. Its language needs to point and suggest and nudge far more than inform. It needs to acquaint us or reacquaint us with the history of our culture, that is in the widest possible sense, going back to creation, the narratives of creation and covenant. It needs to acquaint us once again with our place in a material universe. It needs, in its thinking about and representation of the elements we bring to sacramental, sacramental activity, to connect those precisely with the whole life of a material environment that is making us alive. I am your bread, says the Lord. And as Jones and the Anathemata reminds us again and again, that possibility of cultivation depends on the soil being what it is and the rock being what it is and the grain being what it is. And the elements that are placed on the table in the mass are precisely those elements made possible by an entire prehistory. In short, liturgy is real, effective, and authentic when it evokes for us all that makes our humanity possible in one way or another. The entire narrative of creation and redemption, but also the more localized narratives that we look back to. That's why we celebrate the saints in the liturgy. That's also part of what makes us possible here. And while it would be material, I think, for another lecture to go into this in any more depth, I think that the sense emerging from reading David Jones and Alan Garner together is of liturgy as fundamentally that supreme art of restoration or recovery, which releases what we can be, which reminds us that our humanity is not doomed, destined in a negative way and confined, but mysteriously capable of being turned around into something that becomes anathemata, that is lifted up in gratitude and meaning, <clears throat> meaningful communication to its maker. So to finish, let's go back for a moment to David Jones and to some of what is said towards the end of Anathemata about all this. The last section, Share Thursday and Venus Day, of course, is about Good Friday. So bear with, bear with me, but listening to David Jones is a lot more fun than listening to me. So I think this is an appropriate ending. On Ariel Hill, on Sion Tumulus, on Uru Mound, in Salem Senecal, in the white Bethel, according to the discipline of this peculiar people, in accord with the intentions of all peoples and kindreds, et gentium kenhedloith ont fulka, that dance by garnished balm or anointed stone, here in this place, as in Saras city, where the maim was ended at the voyage end, in his second Ephrata, here in the upper cave of bread, between his creatures again, his body shows. At the low entry stirs the sleeping dog. In Bedlam Bower, once his bed, long years beyond the 20th year. Here in this high place into both hands, he takes the stemmed dish, as in many places, by this poured and that held up, wherever the directing glosses read. Here he takes the victim. At the threshold stone lifts the aged head, can toothless beast from stable come discern the child and the bread? But the fate of death, well, that fits the jest. How else be coupled of this wanderer whose viatic bread shows forth a life in his well-built megaron, 
if not by this viander zone death's monument, by what bride ale else lives his undying Margaron? His only threnody is Dugatine and of the Thalamus. Reads then minstrelsy, nor bid Anubis haste, but rather stay, for he was whelped but to discern a lord's body. He does what is done in many places. What he does other, he does after the mode of what has always been done. What did he do other, recumbent of the garnished supper? What did he do yet other, riding the exile tree? Thank you.